Listening practice test. Test one. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you'll have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You will hear a conversation between a volunteer event organizer and someone who wants to participate in these events. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Now listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good morning. This is the Better Life Organization. How can I help you? Good morning. I've been looking at your volunteer projects for quite a while now, and I'm thinking about participating in one later next month. Okay, great. We welcome all people who would like to make a contribution to supporting the community. As you may already know, we are currently in need of about fifteen volunteers for three different projects. So, what do I need to apply for one of these positions? Well, first, I need to take down some of your personal information. Could I start with your name, please? Sure. My name is Robert Goddard. That's R O B E R T G O. Double D A R D. Okay, thanks, Robert. And how about your mobile phone number? That's double zero seven five three double nine eight four. Great. So, Robert, do you currently work or are you a student? Well, at the moment, I'm a second year student at the National Business University. Oh, and may I ask exactly what you're studying, just in case we might be able to use some of your special skills? Well, I'm not sure I have many special skills yet. I'm only in my second year, and besides, I don't really like my major, which is science engineering. You know, I only chose this major because my father owns an engineering factory. Okay, sure, that's fine. So, how about your hobbies and interests? Um, well, there's a couple of things, but probably I'd have to say that my most favourite hobby is swimming. It's like my religion, to be honest. And even though I'm not really a great swimmer in any sense,、um, what else? Well, I used to love dancing, you know, but after injuring my leg last year, I decided to give it up. I've also just started playing guitar recently too, which I really enjoy. Okay, great. So, how did you hear about our upcoming volunteer vacancies? Was it from the internet? Well, I saw the advertisement when I was accessing Facebook last night, but I just skipped through that. Actually, I got all the information from a marketing brochure at my university library. Ah, okay. So, Robert, what is your available time for volunteering? Well, I study most of the time from Monday to Friday, so I'm usually free on weekends. Do you have any experience doing unpaid community service? Yes, I do actually. Last summer, I took part in an educational campaign organised by an NGO called Z. My job there involved helping disabled children to do exercise at a local school. Okay, that sounds interesting. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. 
All right, so now I'm going to introduce you to some of our upcoming projects. But the first thing I must tell you is that all applicants must be over 18 years of age. We do apologise for this, but unfortunately, there can be no exceptions to this rule. So if you want to recommend us to anyone, please make sure they are 18 or over. OK, sure. Good. So let me run you through our current and upcoming projects. The first one is called Go Eco. On Monday mornings, the volunteers will gather at our premises before being taken by a small coach to some local parks. Your job will be cleaning up, so please make sure you bring a broom with you when you come. OK, that sounds interesting. How about the others? Well, the next one I think is a bit more suitable for you. The project is called Language Assistant, which mainly involves reading to the blind. Readers must, of course, read text loudly and clearly, so having good pronunciation is necessary. For these positions, you must be available on Saturday evenings. OK, well, that could be good. I'm available on Saturday evenings, I guess. You said there were three projects, right? Yes, that's right. The last project is an opening for someone who would like to help support people in need in hospital. I'm not exactly sure about how many people there are, but I do know that they all have problems with their legs. So your main role here would be to care for wheelchair users every Friday afternoon. To be suitable for this position, applicants need to be physically fit, as there can be some heavy lifting involved helping patients in and out of their wheelchair. So which position would you like to apply for? Well, let me think for a moment. That's the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will now hear a talk by a restaurant manager about things that new employees should notice. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 16. Good morning everyone. My name is Luke and I'm the restaurant manager. I'm very pleased that the four of you are going to be joining us as kitchen assistants. Now, each of you have already met your particular supervisors, so today I'm going to just be giving you some general information about the job. Your normal working day will be from 10 a.m. till 9.30 p.m. But on Monday, because it's your first day, we do expect you to arrive at the restaurant 15 minutes earlier. Please note that you will still finish at the usual time. Well, today you've all shown up on time, which is an excellent start. Now, I'm glad that you're all wearing shoes. Remember that the floors can get very slippery and wet at any time, so Make sure you pay attention to that and try to clean up any mess you spill as soon as possible to avoid any accidents. Another good thing is that you're all wearing dark trousers as required. However, one thing you need to note is that you must not wear any such jewellery as bracelets or rings whilst at work as they can be hazardous. Now, we don't have a long list of rules at work, but you are always expected to be punctual and reliable. If you don't feel well or you're held up for some reason, please ring your supervisor and they'll report that to me. All supervisors and the head chef will always be at the restaurant before opening time. 
Now, as I can see, some of you are a bit nervous, but most people find working in this kitchen to be very enjoyable, and we try to keep it that way. It can get a bit stressful sometimes, especially when the restaurant is crowded, but you'll never get bored as there's always many different things to be done. And of course, if you perform well, we'll consider moving you up and giving you some more responsibilities. Now, let's turn to the main duties of your position. Some people taking on this role expect that they'll be cooking some of the simple dishes on the menu, but since this is a four star restaurant and we want everything to be perfect, you won't be doing any of the cooking during the first month or two. Now, one of the main requirements of your job, though, initially is to make sure all ingredients are prepared in the kitchen before we open in the morning. Then, during the day, you'll observe how others are doing their jobs and help them out in any way they ask for. Now, there's a lot of things to learn from cooking, seasoning, to even decorating food. And make sure you pay attention to what foods are left in stock. The good news is that none of the kitchen staff are responsible for cleaning the kitchen. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. All right, now let me tell you about some of the people you need to know. As I said, my name's Luke Thompson, your manager, and I arrange your work schedule each week as well as what you'll be doing each day. I'll try my best to arrange the work for you with a variety of people in the restaurant so that you can learn how everything works and get used to your job as quickly as possible. The next person that you need to know is Reed Richards. In case you accidentally injure yourself, even if it's nothing serious, you must report to him right away so that he can record the situation and make sure you receive proper treatment. He used to be a medic, so he'll know exactly what to do, and if not, he'll send you somewhere else if necessary. Then there's Miles Morale. He's the person that you need to talk to if you break something like a plate or a bowl. Don't just leave it and hope that no one will notice. It's very important for these incidents to be noted so that we can replace these things. And finally, Pietro Watson. He's in charge of the food stocks, so if you notice that something's running low, like sugar or salt, please inform him so that he can make an order for that. Okay. Now, let's take a small tour of the kitchen. That's the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. You will now hear a student talking with her academic advisor about her first year in university, as well as her study plan for the next year. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 26. Oh, hi Lucy. Come on in and have a seat. I was expecting you. Would you like some tea? Yes, please. 
Apologies, I know I'm a bit late. Ah, uh, that's all right. I don't mind waiting. So, Lucy, tell me about your first presentation then. How do you feel about it? It went pretty well, I think. My biggest concern at first was about time, whether I could go through all the main points in just ten minutes. I then managed to finish it in slightly more than eleven minutes, which was not too bad. The best thing about the presentation, I think, is that I was able to stay calm when the teacher directed tricky questions at me. I don't even remember what I said, but he seemed pretty satisfied with the answers I gave him. And how about the students' reactions? They were indeed very supportive, but the same thing happens for almost all the other groups. So that didn't make our performance particularly outstanding. I see. Well, for the first time, I think you did well. Did you design your own slides? Yes, I did, with a bit of help from my tutor, Miss Yennefer. She taught me lots of things which can be used to bring my presentation to life, which font I should choose, which colours should go together, things like that. And she also helped me a lot with my note taking. Thanks to her tips, I was able to jot down things a lot quicker. And perhaps the most important thing I've learned from her is how to be less self-conscious. I used to dread speaking in front of many people, but now I feel much less anxious about that. Well, it's your first year here, after all. So, are you getting on well with your classmates? It was a bit difficult at first, I must say. In the first weeks, they all seemed to be so distant, and I didn't dare start a conversation with anyone. But after a special event that my classmates organised, it was much easier for us to get to know each other. Glad to hear that. How about the other aspects? What are you finding the most difficult? I heard that you came all the way from Sintra. So, is the long distance a problem for you? It is a long distance, yes, but it's not really a big deal. My high school was twelve miles from my home, so I'm kind of used to it. The real problem I'm having is that all too often I can't bring myself to pay full attention to the lecture. My attention sometimes just wanders in class. I guess it's because I often skip my breakfast. I'm trying to break that bad habit, but it's easier said than done. That it is. Skipping breakfast is extremely harmful to your health. Anyway, let's talk a bit about your final presentation. You still haven't told me why you chose herbal tea export as the topic for your final presentation. Was it because you already had some relevant experience in the field? Not really. I had a hard time considering between herbal tea and coffee. I didn't want to go for other products like food additives or preservative substances because they were all done by other students in the last term. In the end, I decided to go with herbal tea. Simply because there were hardly any articles about coffee. A smart choice. Overall, I think you did a pretty good job. Of course, it still has its flaws. What do you think you should improve? I'm not sure.、Uh, does it have anything to do with my style, the way I interact with the audience? Actually, that was one of the best things about your presentation. You maintain eye contact well with the audience. And a major bonus is that you always showed your appreciation for the questions that are given by the students, something few people would notice. However, when you were stating your own opinion, you said things like "it appears to be" and "it seems like." These didn't seriously undermine the validity of your argument, but since it implies uncertainty, I think you should avoid using them too much in a presentation. Oh, I didn't notice that. Thank you very much for your advice, and. I'm having a hard time choosing optional courses that I would take next year. Could you give me some advice? Sure. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. So, what are the options? The first subject is corporate finance. What does that involve? Well, basically, it deals with the sources of funding, the capital structure of corporations, and the tools and analysis used to allocate financial resources effectively. A notable feature of the course is that you'll have to do three presentations, so you'd be doing lots of teamwork there. I'll put that down as a definite. Then 
I really enjoy doing group assignments. Oh, I'm a bit confused with this one. It's called Tariffs and Non-Tariff Barriers. If my memory serves, it was a chapter in the International Economics Curriculum, which I already finished last year. Does that mean it's no longer necessary to take it? Well, you'd be surprised. Actually, that course provides a remarkable insight into the international trade defence instruments that are of great importance to the well-being of a country's economy. In our faculty, it's among the most frequently chosen subjects for the second year. Wow, I didn't know that. Okay, I'll ask my tutor about this one later. Have you ever considered taking economic history? Basically, everything related to history is my nightmare. It's almost impossible to remember all the time periods, the historical figures, and the important events that took place. So I think I'll pass. What about financial asset evaluation? I thought this would suit me well, but later on, I looked at the final exam last year, and I know it might be tough, but judging the value of a course only on the difficulty of the final exam is quite unreasonable. It's one of the subjects that is quickly gaining popularity. And you may ask some of our senior students why this one is particularly useful, not just in our field. I guess you're right. Yeah, I'll decide on that one later. And take your time. The deadline for registering optional courses is the sixth of August, so you've got plenty of time to consider. That's the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear a lecture about pyramids. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good morning, everyone. In today's history lesson, we are going to be talking about one of the world's most renowned structures from an ancient civilization, the pyramid. Now, firstly, let me give you an overview of what a pyramid actually is. Arguably, the most famous form of late prehistoric art. The pyramids of ancient Egypt are the world's largest funerary edifices or tombs. Developed from the Mastaba tomb, they are one of the most enduring symbols of Egyptian art in general, and Egyptian architecture in particular. Ancient Egyptians believed in an eternal afterlife, and the purpose of the pyramids was to preserve the pharaoh's body and all the belongings he would need after death. In order to facilitate his passage into the afterlife, thus each pyramid routinely contained a wide variety of Egyptian sculptures, mural paintings, jewelry, and other types of ancient art necessary to sustain the deceased in his after-death experience. So far, about 140 pyramids have been discovered in Egypt. Most of which were built as burial tombs for the country's pharaohs and their consorts during the Old and Middle Kingdom periods 
from 2650 to 1650 BC. The oldest known Egyptian pyramids are located at Saqqara near Memphis, just south of the Nile Delta. With regards to the history of these structures, pyramids were first built in the early Egyptian architecture of the Old Kingdom from 2686 to 2181 BC, and this era witnessed the construction of all the largest pyramids, including the Great Pyramid of Giza. Then, in 2055 BC, Egypt moved into a new period called the Middle Kingdom, and during this time, the politics in this country were quite uncertain. As a result, pyramids during this era were typically smaller and less substantial, as exemplified by King Amenemhat I's pyramid at Lisht in 1962 BC. During the next phase of Egyptian history, which is referred to as the New Kingdom era, dating from 1550 to 1069 BC, the burials of pharaohs no longer took place in pyramids due to unknown reasons. Therefore, the dynasties during this time mainly focused on building temples instead, and most of them were situated in the Valley of the Kings on the west bank of the Nile, opposite Thebes. Nearly four centuries later, in the late Egyptian period, the construction of pyramids was finally revived, and because of the remarkable increase in the African population at that time, people in some nearby countries noticed the architecture of pyramids. In places like Sudan, Moreau, or even the Roman Empire and Greece, buildings have shown significant influence from Egyptian architecture, sharing various similar features. Now, let's turn to some of the main characteristics of pyramids. First of all, it should be noted that the earlier pyramids are quite different from those built later on. For instance, the early structures usually had a core cased in an outer layer of limestone or occasionally granite. Deep inside each pyramid was the king's chamber, which contained the mummified body of the dead pharaoh placed inside a precious sarcophagus. In addition, as noted, a huge number of artefacts were buried with the king to sustain him in the afterlife. All Egyptian pyramids were constructed on the west bank of the Nile, where the sun sets, in accordance with official religious doctrine concerning the realm of the dead. A pyramid was never an isolated structure, but always an integral part of a funerary complex. Typically, this complex consisted of the pyramid itself and an adjacent mortuary temple, both of which were connected by a causeway to another temple or pavilion located close by the Nile to which it was linked by a narrow waterway. Pharaohs, in conjunction with their architects, engineers and construction chief, typically began building their own pyramid the moment they ascended to the throne. The two principal factors which determined the location of a pyramid during the Old Kingdom included its orientation to the western horizon, where the sun set, and its proximity to Memphis, the country's key city during the third millennium. Now, the next thing that I'd like to tell you about today is... That's the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.